So most honorable vice president, Professor Brook, CRIF members, ladies and gentlemen. Some months ago, I was invited to partake in the tribunal that was to judge a thesis in philosophy. The evening before, while enjoying dinner with the tribunal members, the senior member blurted out, you belong to the science, reason and faith group. Can you explain to me what do science and religion have in common? I see no more relationship between them than between banking or gastronomy and religion. The senior member was full professor in metaphysics. I haven't surveyed philosophers and theologians' views on the matter, but Elaine Eklund does recently have, in the case of biologists and physicists at all career stages from elite and non-elite universities and research institutes in an international context. Her findings for Western countries are not worthy. Quote, Scientists are indeed more secular in terms of beliefs and practices than those in their respective general populations. More surprisingly, however, quote, Scientists do not think science is in conflict with religion. Instead, most of them see religion and science as operating in separate spheres. An unexpected agreement with the metaphysics professor? More specifically, Western scientists deem science as a sufficient intellectual tool to satisfy their intellectual demands, even if they realize that other people may have religious inclinations, as many others develop special feeling for sports, politics, or painting. Despite we all live in the same and unique world, the non-overlapping magisteria thesis is widely spread, especially thanks to its functional appeal. Each to his own and God watching over everyone. It takes two to tango. A different question is whether things unravel so orderly. In the recent book, The Penultimate Curiosity, Roger Wagner and Andrew Briggs use the metaphor of the slipstream to describe the continual interaction and mutual benefit between scientific endeavor and philosophical and religious thinking. Science and religion seem to come to the fore of history in turns. The metaphor can be pressed even further. Imagine the Tour de France bunch. All but one cyclist take advantage of his predecessor's effort. So far, so good. Yet, from time to time, bicycle wheels collide and disruption arises. The balance may be delicate, but in spite of the occasional heaps of men and bikes, cyclists would rather enjoy the slipstream than progressing on their own and sole effort. In my opinion, science and religion relationships are very much alike. Disruptions occur but interaction is badly needed, even though the dialogue about the one world we inhabit presents different levels of complexity. It is as misleading claiming that science is interested just in part of reality or in the material reality as saying that religion only deals with the last why questions. History teaches us as brilliantly shown by Professor Brooke, that theoretical models fail to reproduce the richness of science and religion relationships. The latter cannot help but being complex. Professor Mariano Artigas knew that and endeavored to foster the interdisciplinary dialogue 
between science and religion with his intellectual work and life. A mature fruit of his work is the founding, together with other professors, of the CRIF group in the University of Navarra. Memorial lectures are just a modest recognition of Artigas' figure, aiming at passing on his legacy in academia. However, passing on is a living process which needs for masters and witnesses. Professor Brook, who got to know Mariano Artigas, is both, and consequently, a more than fine speaker for the fifth Mariano Artigas Memorial Lecture. Professor Brook, we are extremely appreciative of your presence here today. We are pleased and honored to have you at Mariano's home place. Thank you. Tiene la palabra el profesor doctor Rubén Nece Fernández, secretario del Grupo de Ciencia, Razón y Fe, para leer el acta en la que se aprueba que el profesor John Hedley Brook imparta esta quinta lección conmemorativa Mariano Artigas. Los miembros del Grupo de Ciencia, Razón y Fe de la Universidad de Navarra, en la reunión ordinaria del 9 de enero de 2018, acordaron por unanimidad conceder al profesor John Hedley Brook el honor de pronunciar la quinta lección conmemorativa, Mariano Artigas. Tiene la palabra el profesor Erce, no, perdón, tiene la palabra el profesor John Hedley Brook. No, no, no. Oh, otra sí. vez. <risa> otra vez. El profesor Erce para presentar al profesor Brook. Most honorable vice president and authorities of the University of Navarra, dear CRIFS members, dear professors and students, it gives me great pleasure to introduce professor John Hedley Brook as the guest speaker of the fifth Mariano Artigas Memorial Lecture. Today, Professor Brooks' speech turns out to be a great opportunity to understand the need for a serious dialogue between scientists and scientists, believers and non-believers, regarding the so-called big questions of human knowledge. As many of you know, the Mariano Artigas Memorial Lecture is intended to recognize the work carried out by the invited speaker. The CRIF members elect the person in charge one year and a half before the lecture. The speaker is selected from amongst worldwide scholars whose research fields involve questions related to science, philosophy, and religion. Professor Brook amply meets these requirements as an historian of science, thanks to his long-lasting work in the relationship between science and religion. Born in 1944, I don't know exactly where, but certainly in Britain, <laughs> 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 Professor Brooke received a doctorate in history of chemistry at the University of Cambridge, where he also graduated in natural sciences. He has lectured worldwide on religion and science. In 1995, with Professor Cantor, he pronounced the Gifford Lectures at the University of Glasgow. And in November 2001, he was distinguished lecturer at the Society of the History of Science. For 30 long years, he was professor at Lancaster University and since 1993, a member of the International Academy of History of Science. In 2006, he was the first Idrius Professor of Science and Religion at the University of 
of Oxford, as well as director of the Jan Ramsey Center. After his retirement, he was for a time a distinguished member of the Institute of Advanced Studies at Durham University. He has been editor of the British Journal of Science History, president of the British Society for the History of Science, president of the historical section of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, president also of the Forum of King United Kingdom for Science and Religion, and president of the International Society for Science and Religion. Among his multiple, his multiple books is Science and Religion, Some Historical Perspectives, which won the Watson Davis Award from the History of Science Society, and the Templeton Award for Outstanding Books on Science and Religion. He is co-author of the Oxford Handbook of Natural Theology and co-editor of, of Science and Religion Around the World. He has also contributed so much to the Cambridge Companion to Darwin and to the Cambridge Companion to the Origin of a Species. Probably today is not the most important day of his entire life, but probably it was August 30, 1972, <laughs> when he married Janice Marian Heffer. I think the Marian Artigas will be especially happy with the presence of John at the main hall of the university, lecturing about science and religion. Because of that, I must say, on behalf of the Greek members and myself, we are really honored to have Professor John Hallibrook as a speaker for this fifth Mariana Artigas Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Tiene la palabra el profesor John Hedley Brook para impartir la quinta lección conmemorativa Mariano Artigas. Buenos días. I wish I could give this lecture in Spanish, but I hope you'll forgive me if I give it in English. I feel it a very great honor to give the fifth Artigas Memorial Lecture. I came to know Mariano personally when we were both involved in a project sponsored by the European Science Foundation. The aim was to explore the role of religious values in the rise of European science. During that project, Mariano won my very great respect as a deeply compassionate man, as well as an energetic and rigorous scholar. I learned of the exciting discoveries he'd made after the archives of the Holy Office had been released in 1998. These threw new light on the background to the trial of Galileo in 1633, and also on the way in which the Catholic Church later negotiated Darwin's controversial science of evolution. Partly because of the long shadow of the Galileo affair, the church in the late 19th century was careful to avoid an official condemnation of Darwin's theory. But the archives, as Mariano showed, revealed more subtle ways in which the church censored Catholic biologists known to favor the science of evolution. In the English-speaking world, Mariano's legacy 
is perhaps best enshrined in his book, The Mind of the Universe. In this, he attacked the view that there is an inherent, inevitable conflict between science and religion. He was deeply critical of those who deny the reality of anything that can't be studied using the methods of empirical science. He was also convinced that scientific progress was not the main reason for the secularization of Western societies. And that's a view that I share with him. When Mariano discussed the disenchantment of nature, he recognized that its causes were, and I quote, anything but simple and trivial. Now we all find complexity stressful, but it can't be avoided when discussing the relations between scientific thought and religious belief. Mariano was complimented on providing a sure guide to their complexities. Because I too have been credited with a complexity thesis, I'd like to make secularization and complexity the two main themes of this lecture. I've taken my title from a passage in The Mind of the Universe where Mariano made two striking observations. These were, and I quote, that fighting against religion in the name of science is as old as human history. And secondly, that in every epoch, naturalism presents itself as if it were the result of human progress. These observations were directed against the enemies of religion who like to use military language when proclaiming that it will be defeated by science. So I'd like to begin by asking what is wrong with that formulation. I'm then going to discuss some of the reasons why I reject the common view that science has been the main cause of secularization. And I also like to explain why historians of science have been drawn to the discussion of complexity. And then with that in mind, I shall end with a brief reference to three contemporary issues in which both scientific and theological interests are involved. And these are climate change, the prospect of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, and advances in artificial intelligence. So, some problems with this language of battle, problems with fighting talk. And it's not hard to find figures who do fight religion in the name of science. Names such as Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett spring to mind. In their work, scientific and religious understandings compete for the same territory. They're treated as if they operate on the same level. Scientific advance means religious retreat in a discourse that pits the natural against the supernatural. Dawkins promotes the view that religious understandings of our place in the world are simply primitive science, now corrected by modern science. Yet it's surely not that simple. From the scientific revolution of the 17th century until modern times, explanations of phenomena by natural causes sat comfortably within a Christian theology of nature. Distinctions between primary and secondary causality allowed both the science and the theology to coexist. To confuse religious understandings 
with primitive science overlooks fundamental differences between the provinces of science and religion. It overlooks the ways in which religions embrace questions of human identity, moral values, meaning and purpose beyond the scope of the natural sciences. The anthropologist Mary Douglas once observed that those who imagine science to be the main cause of secularization forget that religious activity is grounded in social relations, not primarily in concepts of nature. And that view is shared by a leading sociologist of religion, John Evans. For Evans, the problem with the conventional secularization paradigm is its definition of religion as a method of explaining the physical world through the supernatural. This is precisely how Dawkins and Dennett treat religion. But on the contrary, says Evans, and I quote, it is explaining the social world, giving it meaning and moral value, which is religion's primary concern. In his recent book, Seven Types of Atheism, the philosopher John Gray makes the same point. Here again I quote, the practice of religion expresses a need for meaning which would remain unsatisfied even if everything could be explained. But my favourite response to Dawkins comes from a literary critic, Terry Eagleton. To regard religion as failed science, he says, is like regarding a ballet dance as a failed attempt to run for a bus. <laughs> but we mustn't oversimplify. One of Dawkins' most recent critics believes he is a greater advocate for atheism when he leaves God alone and just offers us the other better story. Now this belief that there is an alternative better story than the biblical, one that's scientifically informed and comprehensive in scope, surely can impact on the strength of religious belief. And as an example of the big history in which science and religion are not embattled but in which all the prestige is given to the sciences, I would cite Yuval Noah Harari's bestseller, Sapiens. Harari never doubts that during the last 500 years, science has won immense prestige because of the new powers it has given us. And that must have consequences for religious worldviews. But what are those consequences? They're not self-evident. This is because Harari's story is one in which the sciences have still left room for religious ideologies and values. And there's a compelling reason for this, and it's a pointer to the complexity I shall be exploring later. As Harari observes, scientists face the recurring problem of where to give priority when research projects compete for funding. He suggests that scientists are not always aware of the political, economic and religious interests that control the flow of money. Crucially, he says, there is sometimes no scientific answer to the question why one research program should be favoured rather than another, or why one application of the research 
should be given priority over another. His striking conclusion in his chapter on the scientific revolution is that scientific research can flourish only, only in alliance with some religion or ideology. And this is a long way from saying that scientific discoveries have defeated the religions or that there is no place left for religious values in public debates about science. So I move on now to talk a little more about science and secularization. And here are a few of the reasons why I doubt that science has been the major cause, uh, major cause of secularization. First, just a definition or so. The word secularization usually refers to the displacement of religious authority and control by civic powers which take over the functions formerly fulfilled by religious institutions. The term secularization can also mean the loss of beliefs characteristic of religious traditions. It may also include a greater indifference to religious norms among the public and to the privatization of religion among believers. For a historian like myself, the subject is really interesting because within Europe, for example, there have been different degrees and patterns of secularization in different countries, making it extremely difficult to generalize about its causes. During the Enlightenment, one of England's most radical religious and political reformers, Joseph Priestley, found himself dining in France at the table of a certain Monsieur Thugo. Priestley later recalled that a, a certain Monsieur de Chatelux had said that the two gentlemen opposite me were the Bishop of Aix and the Archbishop of Toulouse. But, said he, but they're no more believers than you or I. I assured him that I was a believer, says Priestley, but he would not believe me. England's most radical Protestant scientist was shocked by what he found in Catholic France, unbelieving bishops. My own view is that the relationship between scientific progress and the secularization of society is too complex to be captured by a single formula. The association of scientific rationality with a secular mentality is commonly assumed by natural scientists today, many of whom welcome what they see as the corrosive effects on religion of rigorous empirical methods. By contrast, many social scientists now reject what was once known as the secularization thesis. That was the view that a continuous reduction of religious authority and function is irreversible in societies permeated by science and technology. Social scientists are now more aware that religious beliefs and practices may flourish, even regain allegiance in scientifically advanced societies. In controlling natural forces, science-based technologies have certainly far surpassed the results of religious contemplation, petitionary prayer, or meditation. Yet, their effects on religious practice have been strangely diverse. 
They've introduced new means of transport and recreation that have provided seductive alternatives to the religious life. On the other hand, as in large American churches, modern PowerPoint technologies very quickly made church services more attractive. New technologies can also facilitate religious observance. Churches are using the internet to boost the size of their congregations. At the level of scientific theory, there is a further complication that the form, even the content, of scientific theories may reflect the values enshrined within a particular society as much as they may produce them. At the time of the revolution in France, secular attitudes were in the ascendant. But this was also the era when more radical scientific theories were taking shape, as in the cosmological theories of Laplace and in Lamarck's account of biological evolution. What I'm suggesting is that secular science in part reflected a secularizing society. This suggests to me an important distinction between the secularization of science and secularization by science. By the end of the 19th century, religious language had almost completely disappeared from technical scientific literature. But this does not mean that religious beliefs were no longer present among scientists. Crucially, the cultural significance given to scientific discoveries and theories has depended on the preconceptions of their interpreters. Scientists with religious convictions have often found confirmation of their faith in the beauty and elegance of the mechanisms, the mechanisms that their research uncovers. I'm thinking here of the great 17th century astronomer Johannes Kepler, for whom the mathematical elegance of the laws describing planetary motion prompted his confession, and I quote, I have been carried away by unutterable rapture at the divine spectacle of heavenly harmony. Those are interesting words because each one has a kind of transcendent meaning. And that reference to the harmony of the world, Kepler did actually translate into music. This is not a score that many of you will know, but these are the melodies that the planets sing, each one in turn, as they progress in their orbits around the sun. One of my favorite arguments in the whole history of science is Kepler's view that at creation, all those melodies were in perfect harmony. They may have become more cacophonous or more dissonant since, but at the perfection of creation, the harmony of the universe was perfect. A contemporary example, just so that we're not living in the past, would be the former director of the Human Genome Project, Francis Collins, who has spoken of his work as the unraveling of a God-given code. That's a religious scientist finding religious meaning in their science. So instead of regarding science as the principal agent of secularization, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that scientific theories are usually susceptible of both theistic and naturalistic readings? And that's a point that was very well made by Cardinal John Henry Newman, canonized just yesterday. 
Not, I think, for that particular belief. <laughs> Sometimes the same scientific concept has been manipulated to generate a sense of the sacred and of the profane. And here's a striking example. The concept of the atom was used in the 17th century and later to argue for anti-religious, materialistic, anti-providentialist readings of the natural world. And that was possible because in antiquity there was a school of thought which ascribed the origins of the universe to the chance collision of atoms. Not even the gods, said Lucretius, could make something from nothing. Not even the gods could make something from nothing. But atoms could make a world through their chance collisions. But note that this atheistic creed was not entailed, it was not required, it was not demanded by an atomic theory of matter. A theistic interpretation was perfectly possible, as it was for Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton in England. Bacon found it inconceivable that a philosophy that stressed the random motions of atoms could possibly account for the ordered world that he experienced. In his essay of atheism, he protests that even that atomist school, which is most accused of atheism, doth most demonstrate religion. The atomic philosophy was more in need of a god, a divine marshal, as he put it, to explain the order in the universe. It was more in need of a god than was the established Aristotelian philosophy. So instead of seeing science as necessarily secular in its implications, it's surely wiser to see it as neutral with respect to questions concerning God's existence. And interestingly, this is how it was seen by Darwin's most vigorous popularizer, Thomas Henry Huxley. For Huxley, science is neither Christian nor anti-Christian, but in his words, extra-Christian meaning that it had a scope and autonomy independent of religious interests. Hence his insistence that Darwin's theory had no more to do with theism than did the first book of Euclid, meaning that it had no bearing on the deeper question whether evolutionary processes themselves might have been seeded in an original design. Scientific theories, Darwin's in particular, have been endlessly used to justify unbelief. But I think we must try to understand the reasons for a person's unbelief. Because the reasons are not necessarily caused by science, but the person concerned might look to science for the justification of their unbelief. And I think this is a very important distinction. The main reasons that Darwin gave for his agnosticism, for his religious unbelief, do I think help to dispel the myth that it was his science that did the damage. Like other Victorian thinkers, Darwin reacted strongly against evangelical Christian preaching on heaven and hell. Members of his own family had been free thinkers. His grandfather, Erasmus, had been an early advocate of organic evolution. His father was probably an atheist. His brother, Erasmus, was certainly so. 
The doctrine that after death they would suffer eternal damnation was for Charles, and in his own words, a damnable doctrine. He was also sensitive to the extent of pain and suffering in the world, which he described as one of the strongest arguments against belief in a beneficent deity. And each of these concerns was crystallized by deaths in his family. That of his father in the late 1840s, and of his 10-year-old daughter, Annie, early in 1851. Darwin did believe that a science advanced appeals to the miraculous became more incredible. But his loss of faith had deeper existential roots. It's certainly a myth that science more than any other factor is the agent of secularization. Studies of the reasons given by secular leaders for their conversion from Christianity to unbelief have shown that in many cases references to science barely featured at all. Conversions to unbelief were often associated with a change from conservative to more radical politics. With religion rejected when it was seen as part of an established privileged society. The fact that every Christian sect, indeed every religion, claimed its own hotline to the truth was another consideration having nothing to do with science. The perceived immorality of religious doctrines, particularly concerning an afterlife, and the perceived immoral behavior of some priests also fueled rejection of religious authority as it does today. The argument that atheists could be as morally upright as believers also affected attitudes as it did for Darwin. In the hundred years from 1850 to 1950, historical more than scientific research was proving subversive as biblical writers were seen not as timeless authorities, but as unreliable products of their own culture. If science has not been the main agent of secularization, what then has been? In his fine book, A Secular Age, Charles Taylor examined the change from a society in which it was virtually impossible not to believe in God, to one in which faith, even for the staunchest believer, is one human possibility among others. And that's a change that could only come about through the presence of serious alternatives to Christian monotheism. For Taylor, the most important of these alternatives, most important, um, was the rise of what he calls a self-sufficient humanism. It was a humanism that accepted no final goals beyond human flourishing, and no allegiance to anything that lay beyond it. And his point is this. This has to be understood as a new moral sensibility, not as a response to the physical sciences. So I come now to the question of complexity in contemporary public debate. By looking at the complex relations between science and secularization, I hope I've shown why historians resist simple stories about triumphant science and defeated religion. 
But I am aware that most of those examples of complexity have been taken from the past. So I would like now to turn to my three contemporary topics of major scientific interest. Firstly, climate change. Secondly, the prospect of extraterrestrial life. And thirdly, the impact of advances in artificial intelligence. Technology and the sciences do have a central place in public awareness of these issues. But human values are also critical when thinking about the challenges that each of these developments presents and how they are to be met. Given Harari's point that scientific research cannot flourish in an ideological vacuum, it's not surprising that there have been calls for greater public consultation on major questions of policy. And my suggestion is that in all three of these cases, it's more constructive to look not for ways in which the sciences have defeated religion, but for ways in which the resources of both can be combined in tackling the major ethical issues. Very recently, my own university, Oxford, has announced the establishment of a new centre for artificial intelligence and ethics. The Royal Society in London has been holding public consultations on the same subject. There have been calls for the public to be consulted on how we should respond in the event of our receiving signs of intelligence from other worlds. The recent fires in the Amazon rainforest resulted in political protest from around the world. Religious voices were among them. A declaration from the interfaith Rainforest Initiative asserts, and I quote, a profound moral obligation to make care for tropical forests a top spiritual priority. So in the next few minutes I'm just going to try to show some of the ways in which theological ideas can still be relevant when addressing these issues. But, and this is an important point, there is no simple one-to-one -one fix in which theology provides the solution to each ethical problem. We are still in the land of complexity. So, a few more words on climate change and environmental protection. As you know, anxiety about the increasing pace of climate change is growing fast as we learn more about the interdependence of the biosphere and the physical consequences of global warming. The melting of the ice caps, for example, and the catastrophic effects of a rising sea level. As I was writing this lecture, distressing pictures appeared of the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific disappearing almost by the day. We've all seen the recent international protests of young people concerned for their future on what has been called the day the world took to the streets. The political issues are also ethical issues concerning, for example, how to protect not just the indigenous tribes in the Amazon, but the poorest inhabitants in many vulnerable parts of the world. And there surely are ethical values in the Christian traditions that should be heard in the context of environmental protection. To understand the world as a gift from its creator, rather than a planet to be plundered, should provide motivation for action 
the biblical image of Adam entrusted with the care of creation has encouraged references to our stewardship of the earth. The need for sacrifice if urgent changes of lifestyle are essential surely resonates with the place of self-sacrifice in Christian theology. Press coverage of Pope Francis' recent visit to Madagascar was a reminder of the high priority he has given to fighting climate change as an essential component of Catholic teaching on social justice. Madagascar, as you know, is home to the lemurs, described as the most endangered primates in the world. Their numbers drastically reduced by rampant deforestation. Francis spoke when fires were burning, not only in the Amazon, but also in Angola and Congo, when a glacier in Iceland was melting, and when food shortages remained acute in Mozambique following the devastating cyclone that struck last March. And Francis's message that something must be done if catastrophe is to be averted was widely reported and I think struck a chord with many, if not all, his listeners. It's been interesting to me to read about the activities of the global Catholic climate movement and its role among other religious organizations in pledging to divert financial assets from companies promoting the use of fossil fuels. And I think it becomes inappropriate to think of religion silenced by science when it has become so actively involved in organizations to save the planet. But I'm also talking about complexity, and there is a complication. And it concerns the degree to which the Christian faith itself encouraged the exploitation of natural resources. In a well-known essay, the American historian Lynn White, Jr. argued that the Judeo-Christian tradition, with its biblical doctrine that God had given Adam dominion over nature, this could easily provide justification for an anthropocentric domination of nature. If White's thesis is correct, then there is a sense in which Christian environmental activists today are perhaps atoning for attitudes that contributed to our current crisis. And it's in this respect that the story becomes more complex. Peter Harrison, who succeeded me to the Idrios chair in Oxford, Peter Harrison has shown that White's thesis is not entirely correct because there's no evidence from medieval exegesis that the Genesis text was interpreted then as a license for exploitation. But equally, it is not entirely incorrect. And that's because during the 17th century, new interpretations of the Genesis text appeared that coincided with the new vision of power over nature that we associate with Francis Bacon. It was a time when there seemed no limits to the gifts to be found in creation and little sense that they might one day be exhausted. It's striking that Pope Francis has warned of the danger in viewing humanity as having dominion over the earth. When we must see that everything is interconnected and that all creation is a kind of universal family. 
Before he died, the cosmologist Stephen Hawking became so concerned about the prospects for our planet that he warned that we must prepare for the migration of humankind to another home in space, first within the solar system and then to destinations among distant stars. As the Christian ethicist John Hart shrewdly observed, Hawking's space pioneers would be humans who have already devastated their home planet. How or why would they act differently in space or on other worlds? Would they not treat existing inhabitants in the same destructive way as European colonizers treated indigenous peoples? As soon as we contemplate the possibility of extraterrestrial life, we generate a host of moral and theological questions. Most of those questions are not new. The prospect of life on other worlds has been discussed since antiquity. By the middle years of the 19th century, there were even estimates of the total population of our solar system. And since I've said that, I thought you might to like to know what the official size of the population of the solar system, according to the Scottish philosopher Thomas Dick, was in 1837. And it might strike you that there's something very specific in detail <laughs> about the calculation, which I've not got time uh, to go into now. But I just wanted to make that point. Belief in extraterrestrials is not a recent late 20th century idea. It was actually a heresy almost to deny that there were inhabitants of other worlds. So I need to spend just a few minutes, if you can bear with me, on the prospect of life on other worlds. Because if there's one scientific development that has contributed something new, it's surely the quite recent discovery of exoplanets. Their existence, for a long time a subject for speculation, has been verified. Thousands have already been detected, and there are predictions of many millions, if not billions. The number of Earth-like planets that we know about is rapidly growing, and every day brings exciting news about another, with preconditions for life closer to those on Earth than any before. A few weeks ago, we learnt about exoplanet K2-18b, whose predicted temperature range provides the right conditions for liquid water and complex organic molecules. On the basis of naturalistic assumptions, such discoveries raise the probability of life of some kind elsewhere in the universe. Extensive debate about the implications of humanity has led to a call for the public and not only the scientists to be consulted about how we should respond if a message bearing marks of intelligence were to be received on Earth. Now this is a thought experiment. In that space for consultation, there would again be the opportunity for religious leaders to turn to their faith traditions for insight. This is not an arena where religion has been defeated by science. Now some, excuse me, some might think that it is. After all, was Giordano Bruno not burnt at the stake in Rome for, among other things, proposing an infinite plurality of worlds in an infinite universe? But even here, the story is more complex than we might think. 
Bruno was aware of the sun-centered astronomy of Copernicus, but his primary arguments came from scholastic philosophy and from theology. Bruno argued that an infinitely powerful God could express that infinite power only through the creation of infinite worlds. And it seems that it was his refusal to retract that argument, along with his disrespectful remarks about Jesus Christ, that led to his downfall. Crucially, among both Catholic and Protestant thinkers, there were numerous arguments both for and against E.T. And to streamline the defeat for theology in the name of science obscures a fascinating history and also the theological resources that have been tapped in those debates. Among Protestant reformers, there were certainly some who appealed to scripture to banish multiple worlds. For Philip Melanchthon, in charge of Luther's educational program, the Bible clearly taught that after the labor of creation, God had rested on the seventh day. Work had not begun on other worlds. Melanchthon's resistance also sprang from his reflections on Christ's death and resurrection. It must not be imagined, he wrote, that there are many worlds, because it must not be imagined that Christ died and was resurrected more often. It's an uncomfortable train of thought. And yet by the middle of the 17th century, there were Protestants who took their Bible seriously and at the same time voted for extraterrestrials. One was the Oxford mathematician and founding fellow of the Royal Society, John Wilkins. Wilkins provides a nice illustration of how Melanchthon's problem might be handled. Wilkins says, the existence of life on other worlds didn't necessarily mean that it was intelligent life. Even if it was intelligent, this did not mean that it was necessarily human. And even if it was human-like, this did not mean that it had experienced a comparable fall to that of Adam in the Garden of Eden. But even if it had, why should Christ's death not be sufficient for its salvation? So I would like to suggest that the possibility of life on other worlds was a divisive issue within Christian theology, but it was not a destructive issue. Late in life, Darwin's contemporary, Alfred Russell Wallace, and we'll just skip to him, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace wrote a called man's place in the universe. And we might expect that as an evolutionary biologist, Wallace would have favored the existence of E.T. If the same preconditions for evolution existed on other worlds, surely humanoid life would have evolved there. And that's the argument we often hear today. But no, Wallace pointed out that on Darwin's theory, the course of evolution depended on so many unpredictable events, the appearance of so many chance variations, and the divergent branching of ancestral lines, that it was definitely improbable that identical life forms would have evolved. And a similar argument was used a few years ago by the Harvard biologist Stephen Jay Gould. I'm suggesting that debates about ET cannot be reduced to a simple battle between science and religion. The facts don't fit that model. There are surprises and complexities 
to unravel. So for my final and third case study, I turn now to aliens not external to the Earth, but to aliens increasing among us. And I mean the creatures that we have made that embody ever higher levels of artificial intelligence. So a little section, final section, on accommodating robots. What comes to mind when we think of artificial intelligence? Well, chess-playing machines that can beat the grand masters. When I first looked at that slide, Gary Kasparov looks very concerned. But as far as I can make out, the game hasn't even started. <laughs> what do we think of? Machines in banks and supermarkets that deprive us of contact with our fellow human beings. The prospect of self-driving cars. The digital technologies of the internet which allow information to be collected about our likes and dislikes in a new surveillance culture. A depressing sense that individuals and as individuals we are losing our privacy. The rise of the robots has become a familiar theme in popular culture but it is also raising serious questions for scientists and philosophers. We now have machines with a capacity to learn. A chess playing computer for example which by playing itself becomes for humans even more unbeatable. Actually I was thinking about that problem. How can you actually know that it's even more unbeatable uh, for us if they were unbeatable to start with? But anyway, let's not go there. Uh, technical progress in machine learning has been much swifter than we expected. And faster computers are matching, even exceeding, what humans can do in recognizing faces, handwriting and speech. Our current machines may exceed our powers only in a limited range of tasks. But philosophers have warned that we need to think hard about the prospect of superintelligence and how it might be controlled. Machines able to redesign and improve their own intelligence are as disturbing as they are intriguing. The Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom writes, before the prospect of an intelligence explosion, we humans are like small children playing with a bomb. Such is the mismatch between the power of our plaything and the immaturity of our conduct. Here's a chilling question with reference to what some have said could lie ahead. How would a weapon programmed to make war independent of human control, how would such a weapon know how to make peace or even when to cease fire? There are already contexts in medical diagnosis for example where humans are no longer the best decision makers. What will it mean for humanity if many of our life choices are left to machines that may know us better than we know ourselves? Self-learning technologies are being developed in which their decision-making processes are no longer clear even to their creators. And there are far bigger issues than these. There is, as I'm sure you know, a new science of neurotechnology in which the performance of the brain is enhanced by its coupling with sophisticated machinery. 
This can be a powerful tool in medical contexts for controlling limbs and improving cognitive function in those suffering from Parkinson's and similar diseases. But are there limits to the genetic and technical enhancement of normal human capabilities? Assuming that such enhancement would be available only to a privileged minority, by what criteria would the beneficiaries be chosen? Would it be morally acceptable for only the rich to benefit? Can we contemplate a society in which there are two categories of human, the normal and the artificially enhanced techno-human? Given such a range of challenging problems, it's not surprising that there have been urgent calls for ethical guidelines. As Nick Bostrom has insisted, the challenge, the challenge is to hold on to our humanity. For that we need to draw on all our human resourcefulness. And that must surely include insights from the religious traditions. We constantly hear that advances in AI raise fundamental questions about what it means to be human. We may say that robots can never be better than humans at being human, but that leaves the question open. Biologists may say that what makes us human is what we are made of, our unique DNAs. Historians will say that to know what it means to be human, we must look at what humans do and what humans have done. Or for the social anthropologist, how humans relate to one another and organize themselves. But theologians too have the opportunity to bring something special to the table. This comes not only from their historic role in defining, evaluating and reinforcing moral principles, it also comes from a vast literature on what it means to be made in the image of God. This is often explored negatively by asking, for example, what capacities non-human animals and machines may lack that humans possess. But it can also be explored positively by considering human qualities that may resemble, however dimly, the attributes of God. And creativity surely must be one of these. And there's surely great poignancy in that we have become almost too successful in creating intelligent beings of our own. Beings that may eventually embarrass, even renounce their creator, us, as we have so often renounced ours. Thank you very much for your patience. Llegamos al final de, de esta conferencia y quería comenzar agradeciendo la presencia y la conferencia del profesor Brook. Thank you very much, Dr. Brook. Thank you. La edición Mariano Artigas, como ya se ha comentado, tiene esa doble misión de honrar la memoria de un profesor que encarnó en su tarea académica el diálogo entre la ciencia y, y la fe y de hacer presente hoy ahora ese, ese espíritu en la universidad continuando la conversación que forma parte de ese auténtico quehacer universitario, con aportaciones tan valiosas 
de investigadores y académicos que en cada conferencia nos enriquecen. Y pienso que en concreto esta, esta conferencia ha sido un excelente ejemplo de los retos y de las oportunidades a los que se enfrenta la universidad y los, de los que me gustaría hablar muy brevemente para finalizar esta, esta lección. Y pienso que lo que acabamos de escuchar nos, nos muestra de una forma muy, muy plástica, muy gráfica, tal vez la última imagen que sí hay del cerebro con, con el chip, ¿no? Como eh, estamos en un momento particularmente clave en el que se pide a la universidad pues que cumpla esa vocación de responder a, a los grandes dilemas e interrogantes que se suscitan ahora en la sociedad. Y ante esta situación, ante esta tarea, pienso que la universidad tiene dos riesgos y, y un reto. Eh, un riesgo de en fin, de mantenerse a una cierta distancia indiferente de estas cuestiones por considerar que no le atañen o el riesgo igualmente peligroso de proporcionar respuestas eh, excesivamente epidérmicas o, o rápidas esos son los riesgos el reto por otro lado es, es apasionante porque ante estos, ante estos grandes temas la universidad tiene la oportunidad de aportar lo que le es propio y de la forma que le es propia. Aportar lo que otros no pueden aportar fácilmente. Aportar pues, una visión interdisciplinar de los problemas. Algo que ahora mismo, en fin, eh, todo un desconsciente que se requiere, dada la dificultad y la magnitud de las cuestiones de la aportación de todas las ciencias. La universidad puede además proporcionar la fiabilidad de la investigación en, en un una sociedad plagada de noticias falsas e incluso de posturas negacionistas. Pero sobre todo, y pienso que es hoy lo que hemos recordado, la universidad puede aportar la, la reflexión sobre las raíces éticas, antropológicas, espirituales de las cuestiones. La apertura liberadora de una perspectiva trascendente. Y esto o se hace en la universidad, o que yo sepa, no hay otro sitio en el que se pueda hacer. En definitiva, tenemos el reto de proporcionar esa mirada humanista y humanizadora que aúna todas las sabidurías. Y me parece que esto también supone una cierta mirada autocrítica de la universidad hacia ella misma. Somos ese espacio de encuentro entre las ciencias. Somos capaces de hacer esa reflexión sapiencial en la investigación, en la docencia. Estamos saliendo al paso de los grandes temas de nuestro tiempo con, con propuestas propias, originales. El itinerario de personas como don Mariano Artigas, como el profesor Brook, como las actividades de, de este grupo de Ciencia, Razón y Fe, al que agradezco toda su, su tarea. Conferencias como la de hoy creo que son un motivo de, de esperanza y a la vez un estímulo. Son una, una llamada a seguir con con esta tarea, con ese convencimiento de lo que tenemos es por delante es una aportación valiosa que además, además nos hace más universitarios y mejores universitarios. Muchas gracias.